Yeah, thanks again, Axel. I know it's the end of the day, but uh, it's incredible how much HCC is becoming of a, a critical importance. Uh, I, I would say this has been really a very busy year for HCC, so I try to reflect on all of this in this last lecture for the day. So slides, please. Okay. So this is the last update. Again, uh, oops, so you saw the disclosures to make sure I show them. And this is the context again. So uh, I was tasked this time to look at it from a different perspective and look at the HCC pathophysiology in the HCV cure era and then talk about first, second line therapy, checkpoint inhibitors, but try to bring up the subject of the hepatitis, whatever it applies, and see if it really makes sense or if there's any differentiation of any, of any purpose. So in regard to the pathophysiology, I'll start with this. So obviously we all know that HCC is a very global problem. 600,000 cases a year, mainly in Sub-Saharan Africa and Southeast Asia. Actually, that green dot in the United States and Canada actually should be turned already orange. We are already doubling the incidence and mortality, unfortunately, from HCC in the United States and Canada. Um, the hepatite C and hep B story is kind of a very interesting one. Uh, I want you to imagine that hep B and hep C have first nothing to do with each other. Simply, they were just standing in line at Starbucks and they were just giving B and C back to back. That's all what it is. Because HCV is actually is a RNA virus, totally foreign to our cells. And if anything, it's going to cause a lot of damage. And you can imagine that damage is going to, you know, continue to be repaired. And imagine somebody sitting in a factory and just kind of trying to put one nail in one of four holes. And one day that nail is going to go in the wrong hole. That's really what happens. And this kind of error will take 10 to 30 years to occur. Now, it means highly inflamed liver, a lot of activity in regard to that damage repair. And uh, this will ultimately lead to the HCC. And the hepatitis B is a totally different story. If anything, this is a DNA virus, totally kind of compatible with our DNA, and actually can get into the cells, integrate within our DNA, and actually that's really where you can see HCC related to H hepatitis B without any cirrhosis. Actually, that's why Hong Kong is really the mecca of uh, resection for HCC, because simply they can resect most of the people because there's no cirrhosis involved. And that's an important differentiation over here that I'll try to bring up again later. Now, why all of this out of nothing became even more important? Because if you ask me what was really one of the most critical advances in medicine in the last five years is actually the cure of HCC, uh, of HCV. Uh, Lepistivir and sofosbivir completely sustained the response. I mean, I still aspire to see something in oncology with those kind of numbers with 100% cure rate. So this is definitely something that we cannot really ignore at all. However, uh, the joke, if you go to ASLD, it's like, you know, the American Association for the Study of Liver, which happened usually in Boston, is uh, those uh, hepatologists who are involved in the treatment of hepatitis C, they say, oh, we're going to be out of business in no time because we're going to cure everybody that we're going to do. Well, unfortunately, it's not really that true. Uh, even though it will be nice, I'm sure they'll find something else to do. But this is a very important paper from JCO last year that looked at the projection of incidence of HCC into 2030. Now, some important observations here that uh, we're very happy about. As you can see, that very dark blue line, which is Asian, this is an important aspect of hepatitis B-related HCC that we are projecting to kind of continue to decline. And the reason is because, remember, Asian immigrants are not anymore first or second generation. People are born here, they are being vaccinated, and as such, we're seeing much less of that carry on of vertical transmission in the families. And that's definitely great news that we're very, very thrilled to hear about. In addition, however, you can see that there is a continued projection increase in the um, uh, population of Hispanic and black in regard to HCC, which is pertaining mainly to the hepatitis C. And if anything, there's kind of like a small plateauing that you can see at the end of the curve, and maybe not necessarily a surely a, any decline in the curve. And the reason is as follows. So the economics of treating hepatitis C is not as simple as, okay, here's the drug, we got the cure, so we can fix it. Uh, it appears to be based on that specific, uh, uh, and this is from the JCO, 83% uh, of the patients will ultimately have a willing to pay, being either through insurance, self-pay, or some party, to pay the $100,000 that it cost for the 16 weeks of treatment for the cure of hepatitis C, which is not really a, a small change in, in the pocket, you know. So uh, actually, the pricing is almost close to a transplant of the liver. That's really what it is. So if you calculate based on how many people we have with hepatitis C in the country, this will cost us an operation of 136 billion US dollars. Now, if at the same time you calculate that 
you would require to treat 10,000 people to save 310 lives from hepatitis, hepatocellular carcinoma, because remember, the pool of the hepatitis C is still not clear totally yet. This actually will be about 16 billion US dollars. So if you would subtract the two numbers, we're really spending an extra $120 billion only to be able to reap the 310 saved from a potential of hepatitis C or the HCC related to hepatitis C. Um, I went on Google to, sign, to find out like what $120 billion can buy you because you know, it's not like I carry $120 billion with me every day. So it appears to be that uh, this is the cost of the Brexit. Actually, if you look at the UK government and the budget that really were very stressed, uh, they were stressed about in regard to the, uh, if you remember the crisis of the immigrants, it was $120 billion. So this is not really cheap money. So, so that really kind of you know, gives you an argument that hepatitis C, unfortunately, is going to linger on for longer than we expect. Nonetheless, uh, this is where the hepatologists will continue to have work because unfortunately some important fact uh, is still ongoing in our uh, society which is that diabetes is not going away and there's already an association between diabetes and hepatocellular carcinoma and morbid obesity also is not going away. Actually, I, according to the New York Times, a very uh, uh, renowned uh, medical journal, 5% of the kids below 10, two years in New York City alone are actually morbidly obese. So you can just imagine what does that mean in the whole country. Actually, great data from Dr. Kali from Emory before God bless her, she passed away. Uh, she actually, you know, was responsible for the great study calling the million people, finding out how morbid obesity can associate with death from cancer as an independent factor. And it appears to be for liver cancer specific among men, the chance of dying from cancer of the liver, regardless of any other variables, is close to 5%. So unfortunately, with diabetes and more obesity is still on the rise, I don't think this problem is going to dissipate in any way, shape, or form, at least in any, in the, in, in any time soon. Now, uh, to try to dissect the hepatitis C story or the other etiologies from different perspective, this is a very important paper uh, back from uh, 2002 by Snorri Thor Garrison from the NCI in Nature Genetics that looked at, a, at that time, what really was understood. You remember, you can answer a million times more now with the next generation sequencing, but in those days, this was really very critical, looking at the whole passage of uh, hepatitis into HCC and how the different genetic changes do occur. It appears to be, however, that despite that these if, uh, events do occur, they do occur differently based on the etiology. In other words, some things do occur more in hep C, and some occur a little bit less in hep B, and vice versa. If anything, uh, some of those fingerprints, we call them, or sticky fingerprints about uh, HCV and HBV, for example, you can see EGFR and DRAF activity is a more of a HCV event. Uh, a, a telomerase shortening is more of an HBV event, et cetera, et cetera. As you can see, there's a very crude table that was built at that time, and uh, we don't know yet, however important caveat is, we don't know yet the whole picture. And number two is, we don't know the minute HCC hits N, if things will balance out or they continue to be differentiated. Some suggestion that probably they don't balance out as I'll show in some data. This is some of the impact data from Memorial, which uh, kind of matches with the uh, whole genomic sequencing data that uh, our colleague Dr. Harding published last year at ASCO. And if anything, you can see we don't really have a critical uh, differentiation in regard to uh, what we call driver mutations. Uh, but nonetheless, we were able to replicate the TCJ data in regard to the pattern. But what we're doing at the moment, and this is an effort, if anybody in the audience is interested in following with us on that and talk about it, we're happy to. We have a global initiative that already is starting where we're collecting data from different parts of the world and uh, from specific ethnicity, specific etiology, i.e., for example, Hebi from Asian in, Hong, uh, in Singapore versus Hebi from Malaysian in Singapore, or hepatitis C genotype 4 from Egypt versus hepatitis C uh, genotype 1A from the US, etc. And what we're doing is we're collecting prospective data in regard to clinical information, add to DNA, RNA, and protein, and trying to see if we can decipher some of the differentiation that we're talking about over here. So stay tuned, this is something that's evolving as we speak. 
So with this in mind, we'll try to kind of, you know, work on the therapies and see if they make sense. So this sharp trial again, sorafenib versus placebo, we spoke about a second ago, no need for me to go over the details. Nonetheless, remember, this is the standard of care. Interestingly, when we start applying the uh, sorafenib in clinic, and remember, we were actually involved, we did the first two, phase two trial that led to that study. So we had a little bit of hands-on experience and we were kind of start seeing things in the clinic. We noticed that actually patients do not fare the same if they are hep B versus hep C. Um, uh, the only reason I'm showing this, because it supported the same information later on by Ann Lee Cheng from Taipei, who actually, when they did the sunitinib versus sorafenib data, which actually was negative in regard to sunitinib, as you can see over here, but reproduced the same outcome of sorafenib as 10.2 months in blue. But more important, the reason I'm showing it is because if you dissect that data from hepatitis B versus C, Asian versus non-Asian, it comes out with a very interesting uh, spectrum of outcomes. And as such, if somebody come and ask me, like, what's the median survival of sorafenib, I'll ask the second question is, who is the patient? Because as you can see over here, hep C, X Asia, 18 months, and then next is hep B, X Asia, 15, hep C from Asia, 12, and have B from Asia 7.9. Everybody will benefit, but not to the same extent. And this is something definitely uh, quite intriguing in regard to uh, what, what does that mean in regard to the etiology. Uh, we spoke about that as well in the debate and how the anti-angiogenic ceiling came about. And this obviously led to many studies uh, that are negative. The last breath of it was the CLGB80802 study, which uh, many people uh, were involved in. And I thank Tony here one more time for their uh, also effort on that study. Uh, that study unfortunately came negative, doxorubicin sorafenib versus sorafenib. Uh, the median survival of sorafenib began the magic number 10.5 month, doxorafenib 8.9. Uh, please don't use that at home. I mean, this did not work. So uh, definitely we, we proved the point based on our early data, but I think this is almost the last nail in the coffin of doxorubicin in HCC. Now, uh, something that you're going to, uh, or you probably already heard, there was a, because there was a press release almost a month ago about lenvatinib, uh, which is a very interesting molecule as well because it's a multi-kinase with, uh, uh, as you can see over here, uh, different targets, uh, including the VGFR and FGFR uh, of different uh, uh, types 1 to 4, uh, that was already studied in a phase 2 trial and showed a median survival of 18.7 months in first-line setting. Quite impressive, actually, for even for a phase two, this is pretty high. But remember, you have to put it in context one, it was done uh, later days than the sorafenib per se. Nonetheless, a randomized trial of lenvatinib versus sorafenib looking at non-inferiority was released, uh, saying that lenvatinib met the statis statistical criteria for non-inferiority of overall survival compared to sorafenib. And interestingly, it had to say, and showed statistically significant and clinically meaningful improvement for PFS, TTP, and response rate. Now, uh, obviously, without the data at hand, as Dr. Bikai Saab mentioned, it's hard to see what that means, but I think uh, this is a very clear, uh, non, uh, how to say, indirect uh, message that's stated in the press release. And nonetheless, we'll await for the data. Uh, classically, uh, people ask me when. I would say uh, we, we know from this uh, whole oncology world, whenever there's a press release of that nature, it kind of follows to be reported at some big meeting somewhere, somehow, somewhere. So you can guess when this is going to be reported probably. So in the second line setting, again, I showed that a second ago, and I mentioned the different, uh, this is the nice thing about the second line therapy, is that really there were different targets looked at. Uh, Brevnib, as we said, again, one more time, FGF inhibitor, Everlimus mTOR, Remisirumab, antiangiogenic, ADAPEC, 20 metabolomic, cabo antivantinib in regard to CMET inhibition. I spoke plenty about the REGO study today. Nonetheless, uh, again, I mentioned the tivantinib versus placebo data, and uh, really it was a shocker to us. Uh, I would like to add one more piece that I didn't show in the debate, which is MET was really strongly felt to be even be a prognostic factor. If you look at the patients that were on the tivantinib randomized phase two study who did not receive tivantinib, and you look at CMET low versus CMET high, which is at 50%, 3 to 4 plus, versus anything lower than that, it appears to be the median survival for the MET high patient is only 3.8 months, where the MET low patient is 9 months. 
So that really brings in a different uh, uh, level of discussion regard to HCC. And of course, with the data that doubled the survival for the CMET high patients, you see from 3.8 to 7.2, almost bringing it close to the CMET low patients, make total sense to do the Tevantinib study versus placebo, which again, as I told you, unfortunately, with another press release, did not meet the primary endpoint. Quite a shocker. And again, we will probably expect data again at some big meeting sometime soon. So we'll, we'll, we'll see what's going to happen there because this is definitely going to be a lot of learning from that study. Still, I would say this is an impressive piece of work. First study with a, a prognostic marker uh, to be tested. Uh, by all means, it's a great effort that, however, we just need to understand better. Now, interestingly, what I didn't say in the uh, debate again is that cabozantinib uh, was looked again in phase two study. And uh, as you can see over here, uh, in a, uh, a randomized trial, once patients received CABO for a certain period of time of 12 weeks, they were is assessed. Patients who have a evident response, they continue on CABO. Progression patients were removed from the study, and stable disease patients were randomized to continue CABO versus a placebo. A randomized discontinuation trial, as you know it from the renal cancer world and many others as well. That study uh, is actually uh, reported already with a, uh, a median survival of 11 months. I will need to update that slide uh, literally any minute soon because the paper from the Lancet oncologist just came out. Uh, sorry, I correct myself. Annals of Oncology just came, came out with Dr. Katie Kelly from UCSF as uh, uh, the uh, first author. Uh, I was tasked to write an editorial on that uh, paper, and I have to say that it's definitely, again, a quite interesting argument. And the reason is because we actually carried this as a phase three trial, and we supported, actually, and argued in favor of not selecting the patients. And the reason we did so is because this is a not a specific antibody for uh, um, uh, CMAT, but rather a multi-kinase, and as such, probably, uh, as you know, in breast cancer, uh, ERPR positive is not like a certain expression. It could be even a whiff of that is enough to argue for hormonal therapy. And in other words, we argued that probably we don't know how much CMAT inhibition, uh, CMAT expression is required to, to, to use that therapy. So stay tuned. This is no data yet. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll keep posted if there'll be ultimately a role for CMAT inhibition or not. We spoke at length about rigorafenib versus placebo. Again, uh, as we said, this came a little bit from the left field, but uh, probably with uh, a, a rather limited understanding biologically. But this data is evolving very quickly, and we are already seeing that there are signals that appear to be whenever you acquire resistance on sorafenib, it means that IGF and FGF can be attacked or rather rise, in other words, and that attack can be from the rigorafenib itself. And that's probably what explains this improvement of survival 10.6 months versus 7.8, add to what I mentioned about the cumulative survival of 26 months in the, in the combination. Now, Dr. Bikai Saab gave a fair uh, uh, a chance to the checkpoint inhibitors to be discussed. And I have to say, by all means, this is a very exciting time. Again, from uh, the uh, uh, data of Dr. al uh, from University of Southern California uh, on the Nivolumab Checkmate 040 study, which was a dose escalation study. Remember, uh, checkpoint inhibitors make total sense in HCC, but they were a little bit late in the game only because we were very concerned about the activation of the virus. There were a lot of meetings that we went for. It's like, are you worried? What shall happen, etc.? But the environment itself is like highly loaded in regard to inflammation. A really different argument from the one you hear about mutation load in melanoma and uh, lung cancer. You're giving it here for a different reason, but still, nonetheless, surprisingly, it does work. And to go back to the subject of hepatitis C and hepatitis B, as you can see over here, very limited information. We have like only barely 50 patients, but I would say probably my best interpretation, I remember at ASCO when it was presented, I was tasked to try to argue if if there is any difference, I admit till today I can't really see a difference per se. But nonetheless, we have to wait for larger uh, numbers of uh, data points to be able to see if there is any difference that uh, one argue, uh, argument would say maybe the hepatitis C and the inflammation that I mentioned in the beginning would, uh, would, would support a nivolumab approach versus Hep B, which is not as much. But remember, uh, the Kupfer cells have PD-1. Uh, the uh, supportive cell have PD-1 and the cancer cell have PD-1. So, it might end up really being no difference and applies to everybody regardless. 
Uh, this is in updated uh, detail on the efficacy again one more time and uh, by all means I think the last number we're settling to is 20% or so so by all means this is awaiting the Checkmate 459 study which as uh, publicly we know closed accrual already so nivolumab versus sorafenib in the first line setting is a very highly awaited paper and we'll see what it means. Uh, I want you to think about it not only okay here we go we have a new first line therapy but this is a very highly uh, thought uh, study that really will establish or really work on establishing what is the role exactly of uh, checkpoint inhibitors in every way, shape, or form. Because it's positive, it's going to definitely speak about nivolumab in first-line setting, and it's going to cast a doubt about what will happen in second-line setting in regard to checkpoint inhibitors per se. If it's negative, it might cast doubt about everywhere. So it's really kind of like very critically uh, and, and uh, strategically positioned study that we just I really can't wait to see what the results are. Uh, the data that Dr. Bikai Saab referred to, I like to use it for a different purpose, but also it's an important one, that appears to be sorafenib naive versus sorafenib treated patients, both will benefit from checkpoint inhibitors. It's incredible that, in other words, it does not matter when, uh, compared to some other diseases, what it might matter when you will apply checkpoint inhibitors. And for that reason, I would say it's totally legit that we see this important study as well of pembrolizumab versus uh, best supportive care in the second line setting um, uh, in HCC, which again, we're waiting for the results of. And then lastly, the activation of the immune checkpoint inhibitors is a rather very complex story. If anything, uh, the PD-1 is on its own, like here you are in New York City, this is like having taxis all the way uptown and you're just letting them go all the way downtown across the avenues without any light signal uh, in the streets, like all taken off. But now what you're gonna do is you're just gonna put some booster in them to kind of go even faster. Because that anti-CTLA-4 blockade will energize the cells enough that now you're going to have a probably dual response with the combination of an anti -CD, uh, ctla 4 plus anti-PD-1, PD-L1. And that's really what the uh, study of druvalumab plus tremilumab versus druva versus tremi will uh, probably answer for us as well. So as you can see, we're quite busy. Uh, and uh, if anything, I would say in conclusion, HCV cure is available, but HCV unfortunately is to remain as at least for the time being. So Rafnib remains the stall standard of care for advanced HCC with varied outcome between HCV and HBV. Awaiting the Levantin positive outcome data, new impressive Rigorafnib data in second line setting definitely is a game changer to, go to second line at the moment. The Levantinib CMAT study is reported negative. We'll wait for the CAB to see what happens. And checkpoint inhibitors primary data confirms safety and response and suggests the clinical benefit, but we really need to wait for the survival outcome data. And etiology related matters really are not that different between the two uh, until we see either, uh, either otherwise based on the uh, phase three trials. So I'll stop here and I'll take any questions. Thank you very much.